live stream brethren who's got this morning to join us. I want to welcome you. And we sing a song sometimes. We didn't sing it this morning, but it's, uh, the, uh, it, it asked a question in this song. You asked me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Re written by a Presbyterian preacher in 1933. And he was a actually wrote the song in, uh, in answer to a question he was asked. Why did, we, why did he serve a man that uh, had not risen from the grave? He didn't believe that Christ... Would, and he wrote this song based on this. Now, he said, uh, I know that Christ lives because he lives within my heart. But, brethren, this morning I'm going to bring to you... That's a fine testimony. The one I want, I want to say, that's, that's a good testimony. And it's not wrong to give a testimony to Christ out of your personal experience. But we got a better testimony than that this morning, brethren. How about this song? I thought of it uh, earlier this morning. Uh, it asked, were you there when they crucified the Lord? You remember this one? Were you there when they laid him in the, in the tomb? And when you, were you there when he rose up from the grave? Well, we can say no, that Christ did. We were not there to these things. But we, but we know that the Spirit of God was there and that he uh, uh, provided for us a record and, and, we, and, and, and he actually gave us a record that is more accurate than our own perception. It's more, far more accurate than uh, our own eyes and our own understanding. We have what God saw, and we have received his word, which is, by the way, the only authorized source for salvation. Uh, we, we, have this, we have this record, this testimony, which is the power of God into salvation. So we can say Christ is a risen Savior, because we have God said he was. We had this testimony that we have God's word on it. Now, Paul said, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we're talking about this morning, brethren. We're talking about victory. Paul told the Ephesians, I want you to know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together uh, with Christ and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, buried with him in baptism, wherein you are also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism and to death, that like as Christ was raised from, from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. Amen. Now, that's what Paul's assessment of the situation. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead, so we, we've been raised up. Actually, we've been raised up together. Having been quickened, he has quickened us Amen. together with Christ. Paul said we've been raised. So we should also walk, he said. We asked the apostle Paul, apostle Paul, brother Paul, how should we walk? He replies, in the newness of life, walk. After the manner of the newness of life, that you have received. And this morning, that's who we'll be talking to, brethren. We'll be talking to those who've been raised to walk in the power of this new life. When Jesus was resurrected, and then when he was raised up, he brought this kind of life to men, you see. A new kind of life. Paul called it newness of life because it's a brand new thing, something man had never had before. For this reason, Paul could say to brethren like the Ephesians, he could say something like this, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, you say. Now, that couldn't be said before. But Paul said, Paul is talking to them about the life Christ brings to men and what this life does, this new life. And, of course, you know, this new life changes everything, doesn't it? For what comes to us through Jesus Christ belongs to God through and through, and it comes abundant with divine provisions. We've been raised up. To walk. And we've been raised up to sit, haven't we? So then when we walk, we walk in newness of life. And when we sit, we sit in heavenly places, which means we do all things according to God, unto the Lord. Without real knowledge, brethren, of this newness of life and, 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 and a new man, a real knowledge and understanding that Christ brings, a person cannot do these things, you see. That is, walk in newness of life 
that we've been given and fellowship where resources are given and, and, and having a full realization at the time of what God has done in Christ Jesus, opening our eyes and ears to the truth, raising us up, illuminating us, and enlightening our hearts. These are very precious things that we can know and understand. It comes by way of the victories of Jesus Christ. We rejoice this morning in the resurrection of Jesus because of what it means to us and what it's, and what it's done for us. Uh, to say it's completely changed our situation, that, that's, like a, that's, a, uh, that's a huge understatement, really, of the case. We've been changed to an extent that it can only be known personally. Yeah. And it can be known personally. That, that, that's being changed to a great extent. I can know that I've been changed. Amen. We are those who can know God. Having received the mind of Christ, we can understand what God has done. We know that what God is doing. We can recognize the hand of the Lord and those things that God does. We do not see them with the eyes of this world, brethren. We don't see them with our eyes. God has provided a much better way of seeing the things he does. You know, the disciples, incidentally, they were not able to see what, who the Lord really was. Not, they really didn't understand. It wasn't until Jesus was laid his flesh to the side. It wasn't until after he did this that the disciples really were able to see. You remember this account when Jesus and the disciples came into Jerusalem to make arrangements for the last Passover? The scriptures say that disciples did not understand much of what was said and done during that time. When the people ran to Jesus, began to lay out palm branches, shouting, Hosanna, blesses the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord, it says... When Jesus had found a young ass set thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. And the next verse following says, These things understood not his disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, Amen. then they remembered. Amen. But when Jesus was glorified, they had understanding then, brethren. Amen. Uh, there was no real understanding to be had, not really, not until Jesus took away sin and defeated Satan and done these kind of things. Amen. And new life is all about understanding. Amen. And there wasn't any then, new life. Not until Jesus was resurrected. resurrected. Brethren, we declare this morning a glorified Jesus Christ. And we are buried with him in the likeness of his death, Paul said, and raised up in the likeness of his resurrection. The understanding of the kingdom of God, it confirms new life. And, and it is evidence, it is the evidence that we have a glorified Lord who is reigning in heaven. You know, all the work that Jesus did, actually, all the work that Jesus did was work of preparation, wasn't it? It's all preparatory work, including the cross. Technically, really, his resurrection and his ascension was also it was all in preparation from the Father's point of view. Because it was the Father's aim, you see, to have a glorified Christ sitting on a throne reigning. To have a resurrected Lord as a king of glory reigning in behalf of men. That's what God wanted. So all, this, all these things before that was preparatory. So, so then what the disciples were witnessing all this time was, God, was Jesus Christ getting ready. He was preparing to do the work. That, that was with a capital T. But when Jesus gets through with the work at Calvary and after he comes back from the grave, his people... His people are going to know and they're going to understand. They're going to, they're going to understand why he healed the sick and raised the dead. They'll look in amazement. The people of God will look in amazement and remember these things were written of him. And this is the record that God hath given us to us eternal life and this life is in his son. So we can be glad in your hearts, brethren, and be encouraged. Amen. Jesus says, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Our Lord has resurrected and now reigns in glory, and we rejoice. We rejoice. If there's not much rejoicing in Christ Jesus, our Lord, it's due to lack of understanding about these things right here. We want us to remember the words of Peter on the day of Pentecost. And let the, let the power of this word uh, fill your hearts this morning. This same Jesus whom you have crucified, God hath made him both Lord and Christ and hath raised Christ up from the dead to sit on his throne. The angels told those who came that morning, he is not here. He is risen. And our Lord, he is not on this earth. He's, he wasn't there. Then he isn't here today. 
What reason would our Lord want to be here? How could a glorified Christ stay in a place like this? He's not here, the angel said. And I say, Jesus, he'll never be here. He'll never step foot in this world again. The people of God, we glory in the Lord. We have a resurrected Christ, glorified Lord, who is our heavenly Savior. I mean, he's saving us from there, from that place. We will not glory in ourselves, not even in one another, because we know it is the Lord who brought the victory. Paul said, now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and make it manifest as Savior, Savior of this, the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. So we boast in him because we know how it is. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So we rejoice in his salvation. It's his salvation, and we glory in it. Amen. We glory in the wisdom we see in it, marvelous the wisdom we see in Christ Jesus, who is the salvation of God. God's salvation, it serves as a demonstration of the marvelous things God in his goodness is capable of doing. We can look and see that. This morning we see what a great salvation our, our Lord has brought. Oh, it's a tremendous, it's tremendous and a marvelous thing. Consider it. The difficulties and the solutions involved there, the intricacies and the details of his purpose and salvation is way above us. We cannot grasp these things now. As Paul was recounting the same great purpose of God, remember, he told the Ephesians, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know that when we look at this great salvation this morning, when it dawns upon our minds and we ponder it and we look again at the glory displayed in Christ Jesus, uh, we join Paul on his knees, don't we? And we can acknowledge, and as we do, we can acknowledge the manifold wisdom of God and all the things pertaining of God in Christ Jesus. What better way to describe it than the way Peter, uh, Paul did when he wrote to uh, Timothy? And without gr controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in the glory. Raised from the dead, received up in the glory, and ascending to the throne of God. God has put his wisdom in Christ Jesus. Every time we look into the gospel, brethren, we see the wisdom of God. Every time we preach it, we glory in what God has done. And when men communicate the message of Christ like it ought to be preached, the wisdom in God's salvation, while well, it's clearly seen how it effectively works, judge the hearts of men and convince them of sin, Paul preached the gospel. Well, we know that. Paul preached every chance he got. He it drew some men to God and it repelled others. Paul skillfully laid out the truth before the Athenian philosophers. And they listened for a while. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. The same thing happens to us all the time. People listen until they disagree, don't they? Well, it was according to God's wisdom to make an incredible and wondrous good thing. Out of what is Satan did in the Garden of Eden. Out of death, God brings new life. Now, Paul says in 2 Timothy, it is God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. And it is in Christ that he abolished death, brethren, which has been, and, and, and in his place, he has brought everlasting life. This is the good news of the gospel. And this is, the, this, is the, this is the core of the message that's always been presented. You remember when Gabriel appeared to Zacharias in the temple? He declared the gospel right there to him. He said, I stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show you these glad tidings. Remember when the angels appeared to the shepherds? And the flocks by night? And the glory of the Lord shone unto them and an angel appeared? And the angel said, Fear not, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the twelve were with him. Yeah. These glad tidings are about Jesus Christ. Each case is the gospel message. The angels are declaring the good things to come and Christ himself declared it has come. And today we preach these good news among our, this good news among ourselves. And we don't care whether men receive it or not. It's still the good news. Amen. 
It is a message that the goodness of God has come in its fullness. And the message of this good word, what makes this a good word? It's a good news. It's a good news that those who come to Christ can overcome this world. That's what we're talking about this morning, really. It's overcoming this world. It's all about overcoming. It's all about the victory of God in Christ Jesus, the triumph of God. It's about our deliverance in our new birth. Christ says, be courageous. I have overcome the world. He gave his life to remove our deadness. He removed our worthlessness. And in its place, he made us worthy. And you make a list as long as my arm of the many good things that Christ has done. Amen. Things that we possibly couldn't do ourselves. He did them. Yeah. And we, we needed them done. You, when you think of these, do you think of this text like I do? Uh, Isaiah 61, I know Brother Aaron does. To give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that, that, may be called, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Yeah. You know, this has got to be the substance of our thinking. Mm -hmm. It's kind of thing, these kind of things. That, that's what we need to be, the, the things we've received from Christ Jesus, that's what we need to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. We've got to know what they are so that when we speak and we, when we uh, preach, this, this is the substance of what we say, that Christ is the is substance of our thinking. And that's what it means to be called of God. That's what it meant to the apostle, Paul. Paul said, I was separated unto the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was his purpose. And Paul holds this up as an example for all the brethren. This kind of thinking, Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, let us consume, let us, this just consume all God's people. If, you're not, if your life is not like that, certainly it should be. Because we have a Lord who has triumphed. <clears throat> and that's what this word about him is concerns. Jesus was victorious on the cross. And he was victorious at the grave. Let me read from Galatians 2. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Triumphant in it. That in it refers back to the cross. Right. Amen. Nailing it to the cross in the previous verse. Mm -hmm. Triumphing in that way. You have to think back to that time. Think back to the crucifixion. Those who were passing by. They saw Jesus. They saw three men. They saw Jesus and two other men being put to death. Other than some talking and speculation. Nobody, nobody really had any, no one really had any idea what was really taking place. They just had no way of knowing, did they? They had no idea that God was putting the sins of the world on that man hanging up there. No one had any idea that raised up so all could see that God put his own, own son on the cross. Peter said, Peter said, if they had known, they would never nail the prince of glory to a cross. Jesus said they didn't know. He said, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. But you know, brother, you can believe this. You can believe that heaven knew. Heaven knew what was going on. They saw what was going, that Jesus was actually going up against the, all the forces of evil and wickedness, up against the powers of darkness and death. Jesus said, when I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me. But this is your hour, that the power of darkness. We got the victory, brethren, at the cross. This is what I'm talking about. This is where God defeated Satan. How mysterious it really is outside of faith that must be, you know, to the world. The very thing that Satan meant for evil, the cross, God's instrument for good, for our goodness. The cross was actually a means by which Christ triumphed over his enemies. Isn't it a marvelous consideration? It was at the cross that Satan was defeated. Our sins have been taken and torn asunder. They've been, they've been scattered as far as the east is from the west. At the cross is where the accuse of the brethren is cast down. Just days before the cross, Jesus said, Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. At his weakest, he's going to do this most vulnerable circumstance to become the power of God to all those who believe. Amen. For though he was crucified in weakness, he liveth by the power of God. 
Brother, when you think of the cross, you think of this verse in Isaiah, and I looked and there was no one to help. And I wondered that there was no one to uphold. You know the scripture. I won't read it all. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. Now, this is something Jesus had to do. All, all this he did alone. He, he was going to have to do this all by himself. Amen. Heaven couldn't have no part of this. Uh -huh. they, they, couldn't, they couldn't take no part of this. Disciples, they couldn't come with Jesus here. Yeah. As Christ gets ready to lead the sin goat out of the camp, he had to do this by himself. You know, a lot of times we, uh, the question might be, how do you know? That, that this song I mentioned earlier asked this question. How, do, how can we know that the claims are true, these things that I'm saying this morning? How can we know these, all these claims are true? How can we be so sure that what needed to be done was in fact done, that sin was removed, that Satan and death were defeated? How do we know that Christ was victorious in all these things? Well, we know because Christ was sinless, brethren. We know for this reason he was not subject to death. In fact, it was because of his sinlessness that he had to submit to death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That God had to hand him over mm -hmm. and act because he, uh, neither Satan nor death had really any claim on Jesus. Mm -hmm. You see, that's why he, he had to deliver him up. So then it's not right. It wasn't right for death to keep Christ. From the outset, this qualified Christ to take our sins away and to defeat the enemy of our souls. And his resurrection, brethren, is proof of this. Yeah. Paul, now he, he's got something to say about this. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Amen. So we have this testimony that Christ was triumphant in his resurrection. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he let captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now this pas passage that we often quote from Isaiah is actually the celebration of the return of the Ark of the Covenant from the house of Obed-Edom to Mount Zion. We know this. The Ark of the Covenant was symbolic of the very presence of God. It was re being returned back to Jerusalem. But Christ gives it its fullest significance. Mm -hmm. See, since he is the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant being returned is the type. And Christ is its true fulfillment. So it's true that we can say that it was written. This was written in Isaiah. It was written in anticipation when Christ will return after his earthly victories into the presence of God forever. This is a, a, a look ahead. It typifies Christ's triumphant resurrection and his ascension. Who is this king of glory, they ask? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Victorious and triumphant. Men nailed him to a cross. He was victorious over it. He was buried and sealed in a tomb. He, was, he could not hold him. This is all confirmed by his resurrection, brethren, by his ascension to glory, and that he was received by the Father. Christ was victorious. He makes salvation then an utterly victorious arrangement for us. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by his death of the Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Amen. We were reconciled to God by what Christ did on the cross. And we received this new life, you see, raised a new life because of his resurrection. We shall be saved by this life. We live today in victory of Jesus Christ, for we can understand uh, ourselves to be victorious in him. We shall we shall continue to be victorious even in the death. Amen. Amen. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, what we wish it, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the, last, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. O oh, death, where is our sting? O oh, grave, where is our victory? But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When I consider the record concerning all that God has done from the very beginning to prepare men for the glory of God, I sense a, this personal involvement of all of God. Mm -hmm. I, I sense the personal involvement of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, how they were personally involved. Amen. I mean, how more personal can it be than in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word became, and the word, uh, and the word was God, and became flesh and dwelt among men. How, how more personal can it be than that? 
Christ's death, his resurrection, and his return to glory. These things were, were done to, to cure us of salvation, brethren. At this time, we've been matured in that salvation. These things that Christ has done, I want to, I want to look from this perspective, that they were, they were done for us to take a hold of. Yeah. We, were supposed to, we want to take a hold of these things. We, want to, we can actually take possession of them. That's why they were done, so the saints could take possession. The accomplishments that, that Christ did, the things he accomplished, they become ours in Christ Jesus. They're our accomplishments. And the facts are, it's because we needed them. We needed them to be ours. We had to have them. They're not options. There are no electives in salvation that you can pick some. And, and uh, We're the elected. See, we're the electives. There's no electives in salvation. Brother, the resurrection of Jesus is stated by Paul. It abolishes death. And brings life and mortality. We got to take a hold of that. You see, all our thinking and all our reason. You know, we got to take a hold of that. If we only talk about them, well, we really haven't taken hold of them. We haven't taken possession if we just talk about them. Peter says, "Which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us unto a, a, li a lively hope." By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, our preaching and our teaching and our talking and our living out in this world, they are established on this hope that Peter's talking about. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and our power for living unto God and the power whereby we give testimony. It's by the resurrection also of Jesus Christ. Amen. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffer uh, sufferings being made conformable unto his death. The power of God that is given unto us, brethren. Oh, it's the same power that resurrected Christ. The power of God has been channeled, channeled to us in behalf of Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of things that have been brought to us. And I want to make sure that I take hold of these things. Yeah. It goes like this. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live by the power of God towards you. We want to have this understanding that the resurrection of Jesus Christ must conclude that we, that we can overcome in victory all the circumstances that come our way. They've, they have come and they will come, circumstances, for that purpose so we can have the victory, Amen. so we can rejoice and triumph of God. God holds out a salvation to men in Christ Jesus, but you've got to come to him. You're right? He's the resurrected Lord. you got to come to him. God would have the saints to be overcomers and have the joy that comes through victory. Even today, we started with this verse. I want to end with it too. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Grace and peace to you, brethren.